Jake. Um, happy Saturday morning. Uh, I am Kellen Johnston. I am an environmental specialist with the city of Santa Rosa. I work in the stormwater and creeks department, which is so fun. Um, such a cool little department to have at the city. So we are actually the sponsors of this program. So I'm just here to be the host, help facilitate, um, answer questions that are maybe city specific, as well as just provide any input I have from my own gardening experience. Um, and I will also be the one who's moderating the questions. So if you have a question, best thing to do is to put it in that Q&A button down at the very bottom. And that way, when we answer questions at the end, um, there will be a sort of queue of all these questions that don't get buried in the chatter. If you have a question that is for your media understanding and that you're like, I don't understand what you just said, I couldn't hear you, whatever it is, um, feel free to pop that in the chat. And or if you have resources you want to share, thoughts, opinions, you know, whatever you want to share, put those in the chat. Um, but I don't want to lose your questions. So if you have an important question, put it in that Q&A. Um, you can also raise your hand at the end if you'd like to just ask your question in person and we can unmute un, uh, you. And then I think that's it for housekeeping type things. We're going to, like I said, hold the questions to the end. Um, we'll try to wrap up by 11 and then the questions may go beyond that, depending on how many there are. Um, and I want to introduce Suzanne. So Suzanne is fabulous. She is a wealth of knowledge. She's been a professional gardener and coach for over 20 years. Um, she's a certified integrated pest management specialist, which you will learn what that really means if you're not already familiar with that IPM term. Um, and she is really working to help people learn how to garden and grow their food and partake in this joyous hobby that helps us be more sustainable in a way that doesn't have unintended consequences for, you know, the life around you, your health of the family, the health of the land that you're on, um, the little insects and birds and things that feed in your garden. So she's going to help us figure out how to do this in a way that's a little less frustrating and a little bit less uh, uh, challenging for those creatures that live with us. Um, so I will hand it over to her and uh, I'll be here in the background, but I'm gonna turn off my video. All right, thanks. Thank you, Kellen, I really appreciate that. And again, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I'm really excited to talk about this uh, organic gardening or, or you know, growing organic food gardens since that's the um, my big passion and I grow a lot of food, but I will be going through slides for about 45 minutes. I do have a lot of content I want to share. It's always hard for me to uh, uh, reduce everything I wanna share with you in such a short amount of time, but um, hopefully, we will, um, you know, get through everything with ease. I'm going to talk about how we can set our food gardens up for success and how to plant our food gardens, some things to consider when we're getting ready. And then I'm going to talk, um, uh, I would say a lot or not, well, you know, about how to water efficiently and effectively. Watering is a big topic these days, and I've got some tips that I can share with you that are going to help us grow uh, bountiful food gardens, but by using water in a very efficient and effective way so that we're not wasting water. I'm going to also talk a little bit about the benefits of cover crops and then share additional resources. Um, just a disclaimer as a side note, I do mention or show pictures of products that are readily available throughout um, the retailers in our area. However, I'm not um, endorsing any of them. These are just common products that I find what I'm really focusing on is the active ingredient. For instance, if I'm talking about organic fertilizers, I'm really just talking about organic fertilizers and any brand is going to uh, fit that need. So just sharing that um, I am not endorsing, nor is Our Water, Our World, or even the city of Santa Rosa for that matter. Um, it's just pictures of products that are commonly seen at our retailers. So uh, what is the Our Water, Our World program? This is a program that um, is actually a national award-winning program, which is so fantastic. We are throughout the state of California and we partner with water pollution prevention agencies and retailers that sell pesticides. The idea is that we 
provide integrated pest management education, not only for the retailers, but also for the public and help guide folks, both the associates and the consumers, us, the general public, to find solutions for their pest problems around their home and garden with a less toxic approach. You might recognize our materials in the, your local retailer that sells pesticides, such as the literature app that has these fact sheets that help guide us to pest management or healthy gardening uh, growing, such as the picture on the left, or also the little shelf tags, those little blue um, tags that we will place underneath eco-friendly products to indicate which products are going to not cause a threat to the waterways or um, the environment at large. You can also find information by visiting the website um, and you can reach that website with the QR code on the screen. And the reason why the uh, Our Water, Our World program exists, the main, uh, I guess, educational piece that we like to share is that everything that we use around our home and garden, indoors and outdoors, but this slide specifically is addressing outdoor. So any pesticides, any fertilizers we use, uh, if we're washing our car, if we're power washing the house, um, anything that's going around outside, when we get rains or if there is an irrigation break uh, or if there's any type of uh, water that is flowing across our property, it is also picking up any residuals from those chemical pesticides, the synthetic fertilizers and other cleaning agents and solvents. And it's going to bring them to a local creek or uh, as in this illustration, into the local storm drains that flow directly out to our local waterways. So the Our Water, Our World program brings awareness between how we use pesticides and fertilizers around our property, um, making a choice that's going to not pollute our waterways. And we do that by teaching integrated pest management or IPM principles. Integrated pest management is a decision-making process where we uh, use science-based strategies. And in the case of the garden, it allows us to look at the garden as a whole system. And from there, when we see a pest problem, we want to ask a few questions. We really want to understand what is the problem at hand. Oftentimes, what we're seeing are symptoms of a problem. So we really want to dial in and understand what is the problem that's happening. And then from there, ask ourselves, is this something we can live with? Is it a short term um, problem such as spittle bugs? We're very close to spittle bug season, which is typically right now, or maybe in another week or two, where we see uh, a little insect that actually makes a foamy mass around the eggs of um, its eggs, which looks like someone spit on your plants. It's very alarming if you've never seen it before. And I do get this question every April of, oh my gosh, looks like someone's put on my plants, what's going on? Well, I can assure you that this is an insect that is doing no harm to your plants and it really just lasts about two weeks. And if you're really um, feel a little grossed out by it, which is fair, you could just blast it off with a syringe of water. And what I mean is filling water in a water bottle that is a spray bottle and just spraying that pest away. Mm -hmm. Integrated pest management really looks at prevention, how we can prevent these problems from occurring, and then also uh, helping us identify, as I mentioned, what the problem is. And then if we need to take any action, the action steps in IPM are called controls. We're going to look at cultural controls, which is going to be a lot of what we're talking about in today's program, which is bolstering the health of the garden so we can grow really healthy plants that um, we're favoring the plants and discouraging the pests, okay? And with healthy plants, if the pest does come in like aphids, those plants are going to be able to live through that uh, aphid population with ease. Mechanical controls are going to be the traps and barriers and other tools we use to um, manage pest problems. 
biological controls are going to include beneficial insects and other living organisms that support the ecosystem to manage the pest problems. And then pesticides, which are the cultural controls. And these are always going to be used as a last resort when we've exercised all of the other options. When we use pesticides, we're always going to use eco-friendly pesticides and we're going to use them in accordance to the label. Okay, so let's talk about setting our organic gardens up for success. So first we want to look at the sun exposure. Sun exposure is really important. It's um, something that uh, Oftentimes we don't consider how the sun is moving across our garden, but when we're selecting plants, it's really important to select plants that are going to uh, fit the needs of our garden and sun exposure is one of them. So if we have an area where we want to grow our food and we know that it is full sun, which means six hours or longer of direct sunlight, no shade from a tree or a fence or the house, then we're going to uh, focus on food crops that thrive in uh, six or more hours of sunlight. If we have a part shade environment, which is three to six hours of direct sun, um, and uh, preferably the morning sun up until about noon or one o'clock, uh, then we want to focus on food crops that can thrive in that environment. If we have afternoon sun, so morning shade until about 11 or noon, and then it's afternoon sun, understand that the afternoon sun is the hottest sun of the day. And you're going to want to uh, maybe reach out to the knowledgeable associates at your local garden center to help guide you to uh, plants that will thrive in that environment with that type of sun, that hotter afternoon sun. Uh, dappled sun is filtered sunlight all day long and shade is no direct sunlight. So I just like to throw those terms out to you because you, you might see them on some of the tags. And then from there, we wanna find a location. So is it, are we planting in the open ground? Uh, are we gonna plant in pots on the deck or around a patio? Or are we planting up against a house or a garage? Keeping in mind that if that's the case, or even a fence, that could be a lot hotter, a, a much hotter location than other areas of the garden. From there, are we going to be planting directly into the ground? Or are we going to plant and raise beds? If that's the case, uh, understand at least throughout Sonoma County, if that's where you're joining us from, we have gophers, which are uh, a big, um, you know, it, it's quite a significant pest situation for many of us. So if that's the case, if we're planting straight in the ground, we want to uh, create an environment that can be um, uh, exclude the gophers by maybe lining, you know, digging out a bed and lining it with gopher wire or being mindful that gophers are going to exist. So being very persistent with our gopher strategies. Uh, if it is a raised bed, we can line the bottom with gopher wire or half inch hardware cloth. And then of course, if we're planting um, perennial food crops in our gardens, we can plant into gopher baskets. And then if we're growing in containers, just understand it is important to make sure those containers do have uh, drainage, they're able to drain. So if we are um, going to be planting in uh, anything that isn't, that doesn't already have a hole in it for drainage, we're going to want to drill drainage holes that are at least uh, about 5 sixteenths of an inch and make sure we have multiple so that water can drain with ease. So from there, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, building healthy soil. And we've already had some questions about this. So this is a really uh, important category and topic to uh, share. Soil should never be an afterthought. Uh, when we have soil in our garden, if it's in a raised bed, a container, or just in the ground, it is really important to amend that soil 
or uh, with compost. Add compost either as a side dressing or a top dressing to uh, established plants. We wanna get that compost on top of the soil around the root zones and hopefully underneath a nice layer of wood chips, you know, mulch. But if this is our first time planting in an area or if we've got a raised bed or uh, garden containers that we've used in the past, or maybe we've just moved into this house and we're inheriting it, you know, an already existing, um, you know, planting uh, bed area, then it's nice to add about 5% organic matter into the soil. And that's going to be in the form of compost. Our goal is always about 5%. Uh, the reason why is this compost is going to improve the soil structure. It's also going to increase the amount of water that can be stored in the soil. Compost helps our soil, regardless of its clay or sandy loam or anything in between. Compost helps our soil become more like a sponge, but also opens up and adds more um, more uh, pockets of air. So it's going to aid with the health of the root zone, okay? It's also going to allow that root zone to, um, uh, that root zone's ability to um, access water and nutrients on a molecular level. And it's, uh, compost is also going to fil filter out any pollutants um, that might, uh, that might otherwise run off into those storm drains. So it's really going to allow that water, any of that runoff to stay on our properties is what, is what we want. We wanna keep as much water on site whenever possible because that's also going to help that water uh, access deeper, deeper root zones that we might have like trees and shrubs and so forth. Another really important part of compost is that we're adding microbiology to our soil. Microbiology is going to help break down other organic materials. It's going to store nutrients in the soil. It's also going to help break down those toxins and pollutants, but more importantly, it's going to help that soil hold together so we see a less erosion, okay? Um, what we're trying to do is really enhance that our, our soil, our, our planting soil, and with that microbiology in the form of beneficial bacteria, that can aid it with the plant nutrients, as well as the mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi will adhere to the root systems of our plants and turn them into, uh, let's say like a bottle brush. You can see in this picture on the right, there's actually the dark kind of tan is the original roots of this plant and all of those kind of creamy white hairs are going to be the mycorrhizal fungi. So when we have this symbiotic relationship, we're actually increasing the surface area of the root zone so that it can now have a more efficient uh, nutrient and water uptake. And so when we're adding soil to our gardens for raised beds and in-ground plantings, products we might buy would have terms like planting mix or planting compost oil soil or soil amendment. Soil for pots and containers is going to be called potting soil. So potting soil is for pots and containers and everything else is going to be for amending that soil. Uh, we can amend uh, potting soil with compost. So if we've got a nice large pot that we've been, you know, maybe planting um, tomatoes and radishes and other leafy greens, maybe alternating those by the season, we might just want to beef up that um, the microbiology in that soil. And we can add a couple handfuls of compost or planting mix to the potting soil, but it's going to primarily be potting soil for containers and pots. We're going to feed with organic fertilizers, okay? The reason why is because it's the most sustainable way to feed our plants. Uh, organic fertilizers actually are feeding the microbiology in the soil so that it can, uh, the, that microbiology can stay healthy and continue to have that really beautiful symbiotic relationship with the root zone of our plants. As I mentioned, uh, the microbiology is helping the root zone access the nutrients, 
but on an as need basis. So organic fertilizers are going to slowly release, release the nutrients over a long period of time. The plants are now able to uh, uptake when it needs those nutrients. Um, organic fertilizers are also going to prevent growth spurts that can attract pests, and it won't run off into our local waterways, causing any type of polluting or algae blooms. Something I can share as a side note is that vegetables love alfalfa meal. So when I plant my food crops, I uh, will always start by amending the soil with some compost, uh, adding some all-purpose or vegetable um, organic fertilizer that's in the form of like a meal. It looks like crushed oatmeal or crushed oats. And then I'm also going to add an addition some extra alfalfa meal because alfalfa meal supercharges our plants. It adds nitrogen and other trace minerals to our soil. It improves the tilt of the soil and it also contains natural fatty acids that um, fatty acid growth stimulants. Okay, so it's really um, a win win. It, it's just one of my most favorite things in addition to my organic fertilizer, just to add a little bit more. I can also share that earthworm castings are a, are a superfood for our veggies um, and other food crops. They contain an abundance of nutrients and minerals essential for plants to thrive. It contain uh, important enzymes and beneficial bacteria and humus. Um, they help provide dynamic root growth and plant structure. And another really cool thing about earthworm castings is that they have these enzymes that are highly effective to prevent insect pests and inhibit diseases. So these enzymes will move through the plant structure, all of the cells and actually help prevent insect and diseases. So it's super cool. Also helps to neutralize the pH. And how do we add this, uh, these fertilizers into the soil? Well, we can scratch the fertilizer and that, uh, um, worm castings into the soil with a cultivator or with our fingers, our hands. We just want to do it without disturbing roots. If we're planting new plants, we when we open up the little hole that we're going to plant our plant into, we can also add a little bit of earthworm castings and that dry fertilizer at time of planting and then plant our plant in that hole. And then through the growing season, I really love to add liquid fertilizers. I will feed my plants throughout the growing season with liquid fertilizers. Uh, it keeps our food crops really healthy. When we're growing food, our, those plants that provide us food need a lot of food uh, to grow. So uh, it's really important to feed the plants that feed us. Uh, we're always going to apply it uh, in accordance to the label, uh, mix it according to the recommended mixing rate. And typically it's once or twice a month. So growing season is going to start now through around September, sometimes into October, but you'll kind of see when our plants start to have that uh, decline. And the way we add liquid fertilizers is very easy. When we've harvested that water from our sink uh, or you know our rain catchment systems, we add the liquid fertilizer to that watering can and we will apply it after we've after the plants have been watered. When that soil is damp is the excellent time to add liquid fertilizers. And one more thing I just wanted to share because this comes up a lot is the Another way of looking at organic fertilizers versus synthetic fertilizers. Um, what I'd like to share is the organic fertilizers um, are going to look like crushed oatmeal, dry oats, or it's going to be a liquid fertilizer that might be uh, very dark brown in color. And it might even have a, a, an aroma like fish uh, from fish emulsion and things like that. Whereas synthetic fertilizer is going to be multicolored beads or when we add water to it, it uh, turns blue or green, okay? So organic fertilizers, as I shared, feeds the soil microbiology. It increases the health of the soil. It prevents those growth spurts 
you know, it will allow the grow, plants to grow at a more natural rate. It's a sustainable food for our plants. It won't run off into our local waterways. It won't burn the plants. You cannot over fertilize with organics. All you're doing is maybe um, adding more that is not needed. Uh, organic fertilizers, when we feed with them, is way more economical because we're typically just uh, feeding them or adding them to our soil seasonally uh, or at time of planting, uh, with the exception of those liquid fertilizers for our food crops, as I shared. Uh, the organic fertilizers are natural materials from plants or animals, and they are renewable uh, or and or they are byproducts from um, the plants and um, animal industries, uh, such as, you know, like horse manure, um, chicken manure, things like that. Synthetic fertilizers uh, feed the plant and will need to uh, be reapplied according to the labels, instructions uh, in accordance. So if it says to reapply every four weeks, we have to reapply over four weeks. And if we happen to just skip it a time, that plant is now um, has become dependent on that synthetic fertilizer. And we are stressing that plant out because we're not feeding it. Synthetic fertilizers stimulate a lot of new growth. They act like um, steroids for plants. And when we have a lot of new growth, guess what? We're inviting pests uh, because the pests are not ding-dongs. They like that tender new growth so that they can pierce the leaf cells so that they can access those sugary juices inside the leaves. Uh, synthetic fertilizers are high in salts, which over time can be really detrimental to our soils. Um, and since we do live in a summer dry climate here in California, especially during times of drought, uh, when we're feeding with organic, I'm sorry, with synthetic fertilizers and that high salt contact actually starts to dehydrate our plants, okay? Uh, synthetic fertilizers can contaminate our waterways. Uh, they can burn our plants if applied too much and they're manufactured products extracted by chemical, by chemical industrial process. Okay, there you have it. But this is what it looks like as an illustration. I love this illustration. Organic fertilizers are feeding the microbiology in the soil, which then allows those plant root systems to access the nutrients and water on an as need basis. Whereas the chemical fertilizers are strictly just feeding the root zone. They are not feeding microbiology and over time can actually uh, reduce that plant's ability for uh, water uptake. Another really important uh, part of our food gardens, our gardens at, uh, at, in whole, is protecting the soil with mulch. Um, this, of course, uh, what I'm speaking to is a layer of organic wood chips or wood material. I like to work with bark chips or arbor mulch or anything that's a, um, like a wood uh, chip or bark, not shredded uh, like cedar, um, like shredded cedar or shredded redwood, those are going to be quite combustible, but I'm talking about the chunkier barks. And then of course, we're going to use them in accordance to with the Cal Fi recommendations beyond zone one. But uh, understand that soil is very hydrophobic. It actually creates a crust on top. So if we do water uh, or if it does rain, that soil is not able to um, allow water to infiltrate immediately. It actually will start to run off uh, until it, it can absorb. So when we have that layer of mulch on top, it is a, uh, now allows water to actually infiltrate into the soil. Um, I highly recommend a uh, two to three inch layer of mulch, really no less. Uh, but that two to three inch layer of mulch is also going to protect the soil and aid with that water infiltration, but it's also going to reduce that water uh, evaporation significantly. So when we have two to three inches of mulch on our soil, we are reducing the frequency of watering by at least 20%. So that means we are not needing to water our garden as often as we think. We are reducing the frequency by at least 20%, which is a huge savings, okay? And 
What I'll also share is that uh, that mulch is going to help regulate those soil temperatures. So if we've got two inches of mulch on top of the soil, four inches down, that root zone is going to be at least 10 degrees cooler than the air temperatures. And this is gonna be really important when we start to get into those 80, 85 degree, even 90 degree days. It's going to help regulate those, the root zone temperatures and keep the root zone cooler and protecting it. It also keeps it warmer in the winter when we have times of frost. But by all means, we wanna keep mulch away from any plant stems, from the crown of the plants where the trunk meets the root zone. We wanna always make sure that is open and free and just is allowed to breathe with nice airflow. So now let's talk about which plants we should grow. There's so many choices. Really, we're gonna start with what we like to eat. Okay, and then from there, I'd like to share, choose heirloom varieties whenever possible. Uh, when I'm, what I mean by heirloom is uh, plants that are open pollinated, non-GMO and are not hybridized. Uh, heirloom varieties are very popular right now. They're very easy to find as or either as a, a start or in seed. Um, they're ideal for our climate because uh, most heirlooms are coming from Mediterranean climates, similar to ours, and so they're typically going to be more drought tolerant and water savers, okay? So uh, this is really important, and it's very exciting for me. I love growing heirlooms. They typically have um, uh, better flavors, and they're usually really pretty. But from there, we can look at annual food crops. So annual food crops are going to be like leafy greens, such as chard or kale. We have our summer squash. We have our winter squash, tomatoes, peppers. Now, I know some of you uh, get those tomatoes and peppers to grow as a perennial in our climate, but uh, most of us are growing them as annuals. Uh, radishes, potatoes, garlic, other leafy greens. These are all annual food crops. But you can also grow perennial food crops, okay? Perennial food crops are really fun. They're going to give us a lot of bang for our buck. We're not replanting them every year. And they grow established, nice and deep established root zones, which allow us to water them less often, okay? Perennial food crops include scarlet runner beans, which are fantastic. They're really a three season food crop as a uh, new uh, bean, as a uh, harder stew bean, and then as a dried bean, okay? Artichokes, asparagus, tree collards, which is really more like kale, um, rhubarb, Jerusalem, Ar Jerusalem artichokes, sorrel, walking onions. If you've never heard of them, oh my gosh, look it up. It is crazy. And then chives, but this is just a short list, just to give you an example. Um, I love perennial food crops because it's a food that I know is going to arrive every single year with a little bit of effort. And then from there, fruit trees and vines and berries, these are also going to uh, provide you with a lot of food over time with little effort, okay? Um, so just keep this in mind that there's a lot of food crops that we can grow that um, give us a lot of bang for our buck. This is a really cool guide that I found and that I love referencing. It's the iGrow Sonoma. If you're joining us from other counties, you can absolutely get similar uh, year round planting and maintenance guides for your county. I would uh, look, uh, just do a general uh, search for your county as a, a food planting guide. Uh, you can also reference your local master gardener chapter, and they typically have great information on year-round planting and maintenance food guides for your county. And then when we go to the garden center, we're going to uh, look and purchase our food crops either in the form of seeds or in starts. And I'm going to, we can also, we just, our have finished up bare root season, that's another option. But I'm going to focus on if we're buying, you know, like a tomato in a little four inch pot, or if we're going to buy seeds. When we look at these tags, or if we look at the packet of seeds, we want to see um, the, that tag is going to give us a lot of information. That packet of seeds is going to give us a lot of information. 
It's going to tell us what season to plant these in, what's the best season for growing, which uh, here the carrot says cool season. So that is going to be ideal to sow these seeds in the early spring to late summer. And those are gonna ripen uh, typically uh, 65 days, there you have it. So uh, around fall, fall. And if we are planting in late winter, it could, I'm sorry, late summer, we could be harvesting those throughout the early winter before things get too cold. And then uh, in the case of this lettuce, we see the uh, harvest dates are anywhere from as early as 28 days and as late as 55 days before they bolt. So these are just some things that you want to keep in mind. And then where if we are planting uh, plants that are already in a little cell pack or in a four inch pot, we want to take that tag. That tag is a great tool. It helps us score those root zones. We want to open those root zones up and start to encourage them to grow out. Sometimes when we're buying cell packs, there's a lot of plants per cell pack. So this is intended to actually be really gentle and a little bit of patience. And we're just going to massage those roots and open them up and uh, pull those plants apart. So uh, I recently planted a six pack of lettuce and I had over 30 plants in that uh, cell pack. So for four bucks, boy, I got a lot of value. When we plant, I know this picture is a little blurry, sorry. We want to plant um, in clusters on a diamond grid or a hex pattern. This allows us to plant a little closer. And when we harvest, we would be harvesting, if it's a plant that we are removing from the ground, we're harvesting every other plant so that um, the plants that remain can grow a little larger. What that looks like, when the plants are established is this, okay? So this might uh, look a little too crowded, but what I've done is as these leafy greens have grown, and this is a variety of leafy greens, um, uh, I am thinning the plants as I harvest, but the leaves of these plants are shading the soil. And when we're shading the soil, that means not only am I not encouraging weeds to grow, I'm eliminating weeds from germinating, but I'm also locking in that moisture, reducing the water evaporation rate so I don't have to water as often. I'm also shading the root zone so those uh, root zone can stay cool. So this is really important, especially in our area where things could start to get hot really fast. And then for crops that grow really quickly, we want to, uh, you know, um, grow them out in uh, sections. So planting one area, letting it sprout, then planting the next row, letting it sprout, planting the next row and letting it sprout. And now we're harvesting from that first row. Okay, so this is succession planting and this is really nice to do. One thing I would uh, um, add to this uh, picture, this photograph is mulch. I would make sure that there is either rice straw or fine wood chips protecting that soil uh, so that we can lock in that moisture and keep those root zones cooler. And sometimes we need to thin. We want to thin these crops. So this was some parsley seeds I put out. I need to thin the plant uh, so that there's more room to grow and that the root zones can really uh, grow in a healthy fashion. Now we're going to talk a little bit about companion planting. So since we're home gardeners and we're not growing um, for uh, financial gain, you know, where these are, this is not our livelihood. Uh, we do not need to grow in rows. So it is nice to mix our crops up, mix our planting beds up. This is also going to reduce pest problems. Um, but something I just want to share is that it's really nice to plant a companion or to uh, favor companion planting strategies. Uh, not only do some plants repel pests, but um, when we are planting companion, um, when we're planting with a companion planting strategy, what this really also means is that plants, those root zones are not competing for nutrients, okay? We really want to plant uh, 
food crops that are um, compatible with each other and not competing for nutrients. We also want to remember to rotate our crops. This one is really challenging for some people. And I'm sure a few of you that are joining me this morning are like, but I, I can't rotate my crops. I only have one sunny spot for my tomatoes and I need to grow them every year. Well, if that's the case, after that tomato plant is done, plant something else in it, okay? Uh, plant some legumes, uh, plant some like fava beans or plant some leafy greens, such as Swiss chard or uh, lettuces. We need to uh, rotate our crops. It's very important because if we're planting the same thing in the same area every year, uh, it's really, uh, robbing or stripping all the nutrients that that plant needs. It's really using all those nutrients up and it's hard for us to replenish it on that level. But it's also going to encourage if there is a chance for any type of um, disease or insect problem, uh, it, it can actually uh, be more favorable if we're not rotating our crops. This is just a great uh, illustration I found online, but you can um, find more information um, out there as well as on that resource guide that I emailed to everybody before our program today. And then what I'd also like to share is we don't wanna to forget to plant flowers. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I'm at the garden center and I see someone uh, with a cart loaded up with a lot of food crops, but please don't forget to uh, add flowers. And the reason why is because we want to uh, invite the beneficial insects, our pollinators, our birds and other garden allies. When we add flowering plants that look like a daisy or a sunflower, um, such as the picture of this daisy and the picture with the serpent fly on the right, that those purple petals, uh, that or that daisy might just look like one flower to us, but those purple petals are actually rays. And that yellow button in the middle is actually hundreds of little microflowers. And that's what we want. We want to have a lot of little tiny flowers. Now, it doesn't have to look like a daisy or a sunflower. It could also look like clusters of flowers, such as in this picture, we have yarrow, we have a sweet alyssum. We also might see um, that, um, you know, when parsley or dill or cilantro goes to flower, it's a clusters of lots of little flowers. These are ideal because so many of our beneficial insects are tiny. We have a lot of micro pollinators out there. And something else to keep in mind is the beneficial insects that we want to invite to our garden the adults uh, are going to uh, also want or exclusively only feed off of nectar and pollen. Whereas the larval form of our beneficial insects uh, are strictly only going for that protein meal, eating those pest insects. The adults sometimes will also eat the pests, but they also need that nectar, they need that pollen. So we wanna make sure we have a nice biodiversity of flowering plants. Typically one six pack of sweet alyssum, I will put a couple uh, little plants around my lettuces, a couple little plants around my basil, uh, my green beans, whatever it is, and it's enough to attract beneficial insects. So for instance, I absolutely love growing sunflowers for my birds, uh, but sunflowers are not only great for the birds, they're great for our pollinators and we can eat the seeds too. So this is really uh, fun for everyone involved. But something else I'd like to share is without pollinators, uh, sometimes we have situations like this, blossom and rot on our zucchini. So uh, I'm not concerned, have, uh, overly concerned. This was maybe one zucchini that a pollinator overlooked the flower. Uh, maybe that was a cold day and the pollinators weren't as active. Uh, I have other zucchini squash growing, so I wasn't so worried, but this is what blossom and rot looks like. And the reason why this exists is because a pollinator did not pollinate that flower. If this is something that you've been faced with and you feel like your uh, summer squash or winter squash are not getting pollinated, there's a number of resources online, uh, videos and so forth, so forth that you can reference to show you how to hand pollinate our flowers, pollen from the male flowers 
and mix it and add it to the um, stamen for the female flowers. I'm going to talk a little about about the benefits of cover crops. I highly encourage uh, utilizing cover crops. Planting fava beans are my most favorite, but there's a lot of other cover crops out there. Uh, this also not only is a food crop, but it does a lot of work for us by adding nitrogen fixed bacteria to the soil. So uh, a couple months before I put my tomatoes in, before my tomato planting season, I will add fava beans to that uh, tomato bed in anticipation of my tomatoes because I want this free nitrogen in the soil. And what I do is when those fava beans start to flower, I'm going to trim the plant at the base. I'm not pulling it out because I want to keep that root zone in place. So when those tomato plants grow, the roots of the tomato plants can now intermingle with the roots of that fava bean and access all that beautiful nitrogen. It's not just for tomatoes, but I was just giving that as an example. So moving forward, I want to talk a little bit about how we water. So I saw that many of us are using drip systems, which is fantastic. If you're not using a drip system to water your plants, uh, please switch to drip. Uh, please avoid pop-up sprinklers whenever possible because that's the least effective way to water. Drip irrigation is going to allow for effective localized deep watering. It makes direct contact with the soil. So we're using less water because less water is evaporating. It allows us to water really deeply and localize that water at the root zone. It is really important that we're only watering when the root zones need the water. These are not set it and forget it systems. We really wanna get that, get out there and inspect and monitor and make sure we're watering when the soil needs it. And the best time to water is around sunrise. We wanna water between that 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. hours. What we really wanna do is avoid watering in the evening because that can attract slugs and snails, earwigs, and if it is um, increasing the moisture on the plants, on the leaves, it can also encourage black spot and rust and other fungal problems. We wanna get out there and inspect the irrigation systems. We wanna check for leaks or malfunctions. We wanna adjust those emitter placements and bring more emitters uh, um, out around that root zone, the drip line of the plants. Maybe we need to add more emitters because we wanna have even coverage all the way around the plant. And so that's something we want to check on every year. And what I'm trying to share is that we want to use water to grow and encourage deep root systems. So this is a really cool illustration from that book, Roots Demystified by Robert Corrick. This really shows that um, the vegetables that we grow, those root zones can grow quite deep. This grid is feet, not inches. So how do we grow deep roots? With water. We allow water to really start to grow, um, to water. We water more deeply as those root systems grow. And now we don't need to water again until the top few inches, really four to six inches is dry because look how deep those root zones are, that those root zones are still accessing water. What we want to avoid is watering shallowly. When we water shallowly, so it's like every day for five minutes, now that's okay when those plants are brand new and those root zones are still young and small, but as those root, grows, root zones grow, we wanna make sure we're watering for a longer amount of time and less frequently. So we irrigate the and water differently as plants grow. Uh, as plants grow, the roots are also going are also growing. So we will direct the water out further and deeper to encourage broader, deeper root systems. Okay. We're buying a plant. It's already going to be that root zone is going to be in the form of that pot. As I shared earlier, we want to score those sides, those roots, to really encourage roots to grow out and down. And then with water, we are going to drive those roots out and down. How do we know if we're overwatering or underwatering? We got to feel the soil. When we have that two to three inch layer of mulch on top, it's always going to look dry. 
But if we feel down in that soil and it still feels moist, we do not need to water. You can use uh, moisture meters or anything that can help you. But the point is, is we need to feel that soil. We also wanna protect the plants from sun. So we live, okay, you might have a garden that is full sun. Here in California, full sun is hot. It is strong sun, okay? So though plants might thrive in full sun, our California sun could be pretty darn hot, especially if it's up against a fence or at the side of a wall from the garage or the house. So it might be important to employ shade cloth. Shade cloth is going to be really important to protect our food crops. We're looking at 30 to 50% shade. That is going to be um, the percentage that's on the package. If we're buying shade cloth, you can get shade cloth at your local farm or garden center. And we always want to tent it so that there's always going to be nice air circulation. If we have just planted new fruit trees, it is really important to uh, protect those trunks with uh, whitewash. Uh, and these are products that you can purchase at your local garden or farm supply, or you can just mix a latex paint with water 50-50 as long as, as it's a light color. So it could be a very soft pastel pink or green or white, whatever. As long as it's light color, we are painting it up the trunk and then the canopy is going to shade the rest of the plant and protect it that way. When we have pests, proper pest identification is essential. We wanna identify that pest because we wanna understand that over 90% of the bugs and insects that we see in the garden are actually beneficial. We wanna learn the pest habitat and timing. We wanna understand the life cycle of that pest. We want to also know its natural enemies and see if they're present. So get curious. Please don't make assumptions and think just because you see some chewing on a leaf and you see an insect that that must be the pest because sometimes that's actually the beneficial insect that's eating the pest. For more uh, support and uh, for pest management and IDing uh, pests and pest problems or learning about how active ingredients uh, the mode of action of some of our pesticides are, you can check out the Our Water Our World website, the UCIPM website, bugguide.net. We take pictures of insects in the garden and we email it to them and they let us know what that uh, insect is so that we can be 100% sure that it's not a pest. And then we can go to the National Pesticide Information Center for more information on the pesticides that we have in our garden shed so that we understand the mode of action and the unintended consequences that might come along with using that product. We have some amazing upcoming webinars and workshops uh, that are also sponsored by the city of Santa Rosa. So please have a look at the srcity.org forward slash workshops website to see some really great, um, look at, we've got uh, more workshops that will help you save water around the home and garden. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you for joining us. And I would love to hear uh, some of your questions that you might have. That was a lot of information. For those of you that um, registered uh, just before the program, I did send out an email that included a gardening resource. I will send that out again. You will also uh, get a, um, a survey in the email that we emailed to you, please take a minute to fill that out because that is going to help us with um, our programming and our funding um, and from, with our sponsorship. Uh, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, okay, so if you have questions,